Hey, hey, welcome to the Bible Seminary's First Friday podcast. Um, today we're going to be covering the topic of prayer. And um, we've got with us today Dr. Scott Stripling, who's the provost of the Bible Seminary, and Samantha Rood, who is the prayer pastor at the Great Southwest Prayer Center. And Samantha's a graduate of the Bible Seminary. And Samantha, it's good to have you with us here today. Um, I'm your host. I serve as president of the Bible Seminary. And we look forward to a great time together talking about the topic of prayer. And um, it's going to be fun because we're, you know, prayer is something we talk about. It's something we do. Samantha, it's it's your full time job. Um, we teach it here at the Bible Seminary, but prayer is interesting because it's invisible. It's communicating with someone we believe in, we trust, we come to know. But it's more of an inward thing. It's a communication process, and a lot of people have questions about it, including us along the way. You know, what is it? How does prayer work? What is our quote unquote theology of prayer? I mean, what is it? So I'm just going to open it up and um, maybe Scott, if you want to say anything a little bit and then Samantha will just chime in and l let's talk about, I mean, what is prayer? How does it work, et cetera? Yeah, well, thanks, uh, Dr. Lewis, for hosting this and kicking us off today. I try to pray without ceasing, like all the time and ongoing communication with the Lord. And prayer is something that like breathing as a, as a believer over time, you sort of do it subconsciously communicating with God throughout the day. There are times of like focused intercession where there's something very specific that we maybe we even fast. Uh, the Bible talks about fasting and prayer as a means of demonstrating our, our contrition and our seriousness, our repentance even um in this demonstration that i need god and so uh i i i pray for a lot of different reasons and you know you try to start articulating a theology of prayer we could use a lot of theological terms but the bottom line is god is accessible to us through christ he wants to communicate with us and we need to communicate with him and that's sort of how what our flow is as followers of christ Good. Samantha? Uh, I'm just reminded of Jesus's words when he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands and my father and I will come and we'll make our home in you. Mm -hmm. I think prayer is what we're doing about that, right? If that's what we believe, if God has come and made his home on the inside of us and we have this ability to communicate and be communicated with, um, how are we seizing that, right? Like, how are we giving God our attention and our affection, loving him with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Um, prayer is the avenue of doing that, right? Getting to know him and, and spending time with him, like any relationship, it requires time and attention and faithfulness and repentance and mm -hmm. effort. Um, and so I see prayer in many different ways. Like we've talked, there's many different ways to pray, but, but that the secret place being a house of prayer. I think all of our prayer life has to start right there. Yep. Mm. And I think, you know, of course, at the Bible seminary, we're always going to go back to the beginning. Where do we first see prayer? And if we look back at the Bible in the first few chapters of Genesis, we don't actually see the word prayer it doesn't show up till the 20th chapter of Genesis. What we see is God having a conversation with Adam and Eve. They're walking in the garden. They're talking. Mm -hmm. He's uh, talking to Moses. He's or not Moses. Yeah, he's talking to uh, Abraham and Noah, and they're just having conversations. And God shows up at the Tower of Babel, and there looks like they're walking and talking. It's more presented as face to face. And the first time we see prayer mentioned is with Abraham and Abimelech. And they're living near each other, and Abimelech has taken Sarah because uh, Abraham said she's not, you know, she's my sister, whatever. And he's like, oh, well, she's real pretty. I'd like to, you know, spend some time with this young lady. And um, then he has a, a vision, and God comes to him and says, ask Abraham to pray for you because she is his wife. And he's like, wait a minute, I didn't know anything about this. <laughs> and so God first mentions the word prayer in a vision to Abimelech who's not one of the godly people that we know in scripture. We don't know that he's a horrible guy, but God is stepping in to intervene with someone who's doing something wrong. And he's telling him, ask this man to pray for you. And it seems like obviously Abraham knows what prayer is and he speaks to God and 
Abimelech's family's healed. And so the very first time we see it is God is using this word and this concept to advocate for someone to keep from harm and to give them favor. And it's an interesting introduction. Um, as we go on, we see uh, Pharaoh asking Moses to pray for him that all these bad things that have been happening, that his family would be healed. So some of those first instances of prayer are maybe adversaries of the kingdom or sinners that God is uh, participating in an advocate and using an advocate. So that is actually our introduction to the whole idea, but it evolves from communication. They had a relationship, Samantha, that's what you talked about. You know, we have a relationship with someone and the fact that God is spirit, that he seems to be mostly invisible most of the time, <clears throat> then we're having a conversation. I would say in our day and world, we have the ability to understand it more than any previous people in history, because what do we do all day? We talk on a cell phone to people that are invisible unless you FaceTime them. It's going over the airwaves, you know, mm -hmm. it's invisible communication. It's instantaneous worldwide these days. I mean, what a great understanding of may maybe how prayer may actually work. Absolutely. Having a sixth grader, um, <laughs> the Lord has really kind of opened my eyes. How do we teach about prayer? Um, but more, how do I disciple my kiddo? Like, how do I just teach my kid how to hear the voice of the Lord and obey? Yeah. Um, and it's really been fascinating to talk to him about that. So he'll say like, so I have like tech in me. And I was like, yes, you were constructed by a divine maker who loves you with tech like you were yeah. made to hear from him yeah. and to communicate back to him whether it's an audible voice or you know just they get it in an interesting way these kiddos who have never lived without this kind of technology right and i think i agree dr lewis what an inspiring and interesting time to be alive and in love with jesus when it seems like the technology of heaven is now we're seeing that in part as our own technology and i think the references that we can make um like you said it's invisible but but i know it's happening right like i hear the voice i'm being communicated back yeah. um maybe it's yeah. a text message maybe it's an email um but but all of these things out in the ether we're still able to communicate pretty clearly um yeah. so i think that's a fun you know seasonal thing we're experiencing as the body of Christ. Yeah, and it's like the newer technology. I mean, now we can have a group phone call. So we each have an individual number, but we've got somebody who's hosting the call and then we're all on the call together. Now, back in the day when phones first started, they had, you know, you plugged into the thing and everybody in the neighborhood could hear everything that Scott was saying, you know, to his, whoever called him and we're all like, listening in on the phone, but it's almost like having a great phone call or like a radio. Do you have that channel? So the technology, are we on God's channel? He's then able to communicate with us, but if we're on a different channel, we don't even hear anything he's saying. Yeah. Um, if, if you've seen the movie, Bruce Almighty, you, you, yep. you can't, can't forget the scenes where, you know, God gives him his powers and then he's, he's overwhelmed with all these prayers that are just overwhelmingly coming at him. And of course, the, the thing is that most of them are very self-centered. And if we're honest, most of the prayers that we pray to are, you know, God help me, give me grace today, be with my wife while she does, the, the, does this, you know. Um, but there are times that God lifts us up and allows us to see a different perspective. And you mentioned Abraham, you mentioned Moses and this intercessory sort of a role. I was thinking about Cornelius in Acts 10, when the angel comes and he speaks to Cornelius, who is a God fear, he, he was not a full convert to Judaism, but he was about to become a full believer in Jesus Christ. And the angel says to him that your prayers have arisen as a memorial to God. So while you were praying these prayers, maybe not with full understanding yet of, you know, entirely who God was and what his plan was, but you were praying in faith. Like Abraham was a moon worshiper, but somehow in the midst of his polytheism, he began to call out to God. God put a desire in him to seek him and for repentance. 
And this came back to Cornelius as a memorial up to God. And even in Revelation, this just incredible imagery of the prayers of the saints as an incense that rises up uh, before God. And so it's good that we remind each other that prayer is powerful, prayer is passionate, prayer is purposeful. And I think about a series I read when I first became a, a Christian by E.M. Bounds, the great uh, Wesleyan theologian on prayer, you know, the, the power of prayer and the purpose of prayer and prayer and praying men in this, this entire series. Um, it's really motivational. You can see why the early church, this was one of their four main emphases, you know, the, the Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking Bread, and Prayer. Yep. <clears throat> so one of the questions people have sometimes is, you know, the, we use this word intercessory. So Samantha, that's part of what the prayer center is doing and you're helping lead. And we actually, I mean, the case I mentioned with Abimelech, God is asking Abimelech to ask someone to intercede for him. And then with Hagar, when Hagar is out in the wilderness and God speaks to her, she's in need and God is intervening on her behalf. And then with Moses, uh, Pharaoh is asking Moses to intervene. So some of the earliest cases we see are either God himself or people that God designates as representatives mm -hmm. to pray for someone. So Samantha, how does that kind of what's the perspective then today on intercessory prayer? Like Dr. Stripling said, you know, we get to be involved. What, what does that mean? I think in part, it is addressing yourself as a house of prayer, right? It's the difference between when I have an emergency, I'm calling someone I think I know, and I think they can help me rather than I know this person. And I know that they will help me. Not only can they, they will help me. Um, so when we're training people in intercession, it's first and foremost, you know, Matthew six, you got to get in your closet. You've got to get to know God. And because of the nature of Jesus's ministry, right, he is sitting at the hand, the right hand of the father, making intercession for us. So we really want to make that connection between knowing Jesus is knowing how to intercede. We ask, Lord, teach me to pray the prayers you're already praying. Teach me mm -hmm. to agree with you in the place of prayer, not just approaching you as a as not a stranger, right? Because we believe in Jesus, we're, we're brought into the family, but there's a difference between knowing someone and, and knowing someone, giving them your time, your attention, sitting at their feet to learn from them. Um, so the place of prayer is a place to be discipled by Jesus, who is the intercessor. Um, so I find intercession can be heavy. It can be a burden. It can be long hope deferred seasons. But if you are in that place with Jesus and you are asking him to teach you how to pray, there's no, there's no going wrong, right? Whether each of us, you know, each of us have been made to care about the things we care about, the people we care about, the places, the spaces, he designed us that way. Um, and he gave us that desire. So as we get close to him, we're not implementing a system or a program. We're, we're in spirit and in truth, right? Um, and I think that's where prayer has kind of gotten um, maybe off the rails just a little bit sometimes. Like I come from a charismatic background and intercession can mean a lot of things, right? Um, but I never really remembered hearing we're just talking with Jesus about the things he's already doing. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that really makes intercession enjoyable, sustainable and effective, right? Like God promises us those things about prayer if we're doing it in the way he designed us to do it. So what about what about people who say, well, I've been praying about something, but I don't get an answer. So I'm interceding, but I don't get what I'm wanting. Um, like when the servant goes to pray for uh, is it Rachel and he's standing by there and the camels are coming and the girls come in with the water jars and the servant prays, Lord, give me success in my master's quest to get a wife for my master. And if such and such happens, then I'll know my prayer is answered. But and then he got an immediate answer, like within a few minutes, you know, and he's all happy and he goes back home, he's successful. But what about those times we pray and we don't see what we think we're looking for? Hmm. Well, I, oh, over time, I think as we deepen in our relationship with the Lord, we come to have a trust, a confidence based on my past experiences that even when there have been delays in response, 
that that did not mean that God was not aware and that God was not doing more behind my back than he was in front of my face. And so I, I tend to have confidence then in the middle of a crisis. Now, of course, that's harder for someone who's perhaps new in the faith and because they don't know the Lord that well yet. Uh, they, they've trusted him and they've given their lives, but they haven't seen him come through time and time again. And maybe they, they don't draw upon that sort of in a sense of like, you know, a, a new marriage as opposed to a, a well-established marriage. There's I, like, I know this person says she loves me and I know I think I love her, but we've kind of hit the wall here. And are, are we going to make it through this? Whereas when you've been through a few situations like that over time, you have a confidence that this, everything's going to be okay. Yeah. It seems to maybe, um, Scott, you referenced something earlier, maybe prayers add up in some way. In some cases, God is, maybe he's got some quota that he's waiting on. We got to pass some margin. I mean, I don't know. And I don't think that's the case every time, but there does seem to be some evidence in some cases that God is waiting on a certain time, a certain people, a certain place, and he's got his plan. The beauty is we get to be involved and it's not certain, but also we can pray in faith because I know for the three of us, yeah. we've all prayed things that have been answered okay. really even while we're praying them or even before they were prayed, we even knew about it. And then other things we may have prayed about for years before, you know, we finally got an answer. And then sometimes we wanted something and the answer was no. So that no is still an answer. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yes. And I think the longer, Dr. Stripling, you alluded to this, the longer you're with a person, right? And God's a person. Right. The Lord is a person. The longer you're with someone, you have this, this history, you have these memories, right? The Lord is faithful. Um, and often I think, I think back about some prayers I prayed before I was really in the practice of a lifestyle of prayer, right? Mm -hmm. I was asking for dumb stuff, mm -hmm. right? Like I was asking for, for small or, or selfish or mm -hmm. inward when the Lord invites us to into his glory, right? Like it's way bigger than just that. And so I think if, if the goal of prayer is to be with the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. Be with him. Then, then the goal is achieved. Like, I think we enter into prayer often as, as evangelicals or Westerners. Um, prayer is a place to be good or right. Prayer is a place to prove to God how good we are or how much we love him. Um, when, when prayer itself is the opportunity to be with the Lord um, and not be good, but be honest, be real. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that's part of what y'all are doing at the prayer center is you have time where people are worshiping and leading in worship and sometimes people are praying audibly sometimes people are praying silently but it's that time together you know sometimes we think if i don't pray every day um, then I, maybe i'm sinning or something um, but the truth is is prayer just our words to god or is prayer also include god's words to us and also, does prayer include we're not talking at all? We're just sitting in a room together. I mean, me and my wife, sometimes we actually don't talk to each other. We just spend time together beside each other. Okay. And friends, we, we don't talk all the time, but we're in communication. We're sharing that time. So is that part of prayer? I mean, mm. can we be considered as praying without ceasing if we're not talking all the time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Samantha. <laughs> we, we both jumped on that one. <laughs> I think there's just a prayer practice that I love, and I honestly can't remember who, like the origin of it, but it's simply, I look at him, he looks at me, and we are happy. Hmm. And that's the prayer practice. I look at him, he looks at me, and we are happy. Um, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Stripling. That was burning in my heart to share. That's awesome. Well, when when we are silent, when we do listen, and listening is part of, of prayer, part of communication. Um, um, do what? I didn't hear what you just said. <laughs> I, I rest my case. Welcome to my world, Samantha. See, when, when I am listening, then um, one of the questions I'm trying to ask myself is, what is Jesus praying for me? Because Hebrews says that I have a high priest who never ceases to make intercession for me. That means that right this moment, Jesus is praying for me. 
and for you and for you, Dr. Lewis, and he's probably praying different things for me than he's praying for you. And if I can train my spiritual senses to align with that and, and ask myself the question or ask the Lord the question also, like, what are you praying for me? And then I can begin to pray that, come into agreement with him, which I learned through listening, then that's powerful. That's when heaven and earth come together and, and powerful prayers. And, and everyone who's watching the podcast, I hope they'll ask themselves that very question. What is Jesus praying for you right now? And if you'll come into agreement with that and pray that, wow, you'll see a whole new dimension to your prayer life. Okay. And that's part of Jesus prayer, you know, thy will be done on earth mm -hmm. as in heaven. You know, and may we come in alignment with whatever, you know, God's intent is. Mm -hmm. Well, I think sometimes we're, we're so inspector gadget about it and we feel like, okay, I've got to decipher and like discern what is the Lord saying when there's such a freedom and a beauty to saying, I agree with you, Jesus. I am so caught up in the mess, in the weeds of, of the details of this. I choose to believe you that you've given me peace that passes understanding. I choose to believe the Sermon on the Mount. Don't worry about your life. I, I'm going to do that, Lord. I'm going to choose to be obedient and I'm going to agree with whatever you're praying for me. And mm. there are situations, you know, you guys have been in ministry, you're you're grown ups. There's hard stuff. There's hard seasons. Um, there's times where I don't want to pray for someone or for something. And the peace and the beauty and the power of telling Jesus, thank you that you're praying for them. Thank you that mm -hmm. you know the details of this situation. I just agree with you, Lord. I don't need to know the details. Mm -hmm. I'm not down here trying to, you know, it's like the Greek mind. I can't understand it. It must be God. I must figure this out. And the Hebrew mind would say, I can't understand it. This must be God. Yeah. Ah, right. <laughs> That's good. So, Dr. Shipley, maybe if we go forward, maybe in time in scripture, maybe is there any background you could share with us maybe about how did the Israelites, particularly maybe in the Old Testament, what, how did they pray? What was their practices of prayer that we either see in scripture or anything we know from archaeology, even leading up to New Testament times? Well, that's a good question. One thing that a lot of people don't think about or maybe aren't aware of is there was no such thing as silent prayer in biblical times. Um, you, you, didn't, you never would pray silently, nor would you read scripture silently. It was always read aloud. Prayers were always allowed. Think about Hannah when she comes to Shiloh, a desperate woman. And you talk about someone who got God's attention. She is to the point that she doesn't care what anyone thinks about her. And she is so uh, desperate that she can't formulate her words properly. She's sort of mumbling. And so Eli, of course, he's quite aged at this point, but the, the high priest Eli thinks she's drunk. Right. And he rebukes her like, silly woman, you know, what, what do you... What, what are you drinking? It's not five o'clock. You know, why, why are you inebriated when you've come to church? And she just says, no, my Lord, it is. This is not the case. I am in deep distress. And then he realizes she was interceding um, in, in this moment. And of course, she got his attention and she got God's attention. So uh, I guess that's one thing, Dr. Lewis, to answer the question directly is that um, they always prayed out, out loud. And as Westerners, as Samantha mentioned early this earlier, this dichotomy, we're more introverted. Um, and like it, when I'm in the Middle East, my Jewish friends and my Muslim friends, they're praying out loud. They don't care who's around. They're not embarrassed or self-conscious. And we as Westerners tend to be more um, like I wouldn't want to impose my prayers on, on them. They're so, conservative. Yeah. Yeah. Or, and I'll give you another example, like the Psalms, um, the Psalms were never intended to be read and not even prayed. We talk about, you know, being a Psalter, the Psalms were intended to be sung and you will never get the power of the Psalms unless you sing them and you got to sing them out loud. Yep. So that means in your prayer time, whatever that looks like in your car or at home or wherever. And like for me, I would be self-conscious because I don't really sing. I'm, you know, both of you guys might think it's awesome. That's why but scripture I, says to make a joyful noise. Well, that's about what it is. But but I have made myself do this. And wow, now the Psalms then become a, another form of prayer. Now it's not just David's Psalm. It's my Psalm. I've made it my own when I do it out loud. And we do speak into the Psalms, we do see in the Psalms, 
the author of the psalm speaking, but then also the psalm records the Lord speaking to them yeah. in this thing. So it is a two-way communication. Conversation, yeah. Um, Samantha, how does the prayer center work? I mean, what do y'all do there? What is, what's your, what happens there? Well, sometimes I feel like Hannah. Like <laughs> people can walk in and be like, what the heck's going on in here? Because <laughs> um, sometimes it looks really, uh, maybe more silent. We do a lot of alone together with Jesus, right? You're welcome to come in anytime and have your prayer practice. Um, we do a little bit of public reading of scripture. We have live prayer and worship. We have intercession sets for Israel in the Middle East, um, for Vietnam. Um, we're doing a little bit of everything, but the core of what we do is enjoyable, sustainable, and effective prayer. These are the promises from the word of God about prayer, right? I will make them joyful. These foreigners, I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Um, and so I think, um, that's really our our mandate and then we're in a season of normalizing prayer we just want prayer to be the norm we want mm. prayer to be um absolutely we are the people of god we pray yes yeah. back to avimelech moses was gonna pray right or abraham, or abraham. Mm -hmm. i mean abraham yeah. was gonna pray right yeah. um and so being the people who are availing ourselves to the Lord to be houses of prayer mm -hmm. and then also being available to pray for people. We do both of those people, places, regions, land, um, really just connecting with the spirit of the Lord in order to make his presence known, in order to normalize this weird thing that's silent but open communication mm -hmm. and embracing that right right rather than saying let's hide it or um i'll pray for you silently after i leave this situation no we're we're wanting to train people to normalize prayer you encounter a need meet the need talk to jesus on behalf of your friends mm -hmm. how how much like how could we get any more loving than that than taking you know, our brothers and sisters or the stranger at Walmart or whatever before the throne of the Lord and entrusting them to him. Um, I think and I you, think mentioned, a, yeah, you mentioned earlier, too, and you just mentioned, too, about the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, how does the Holy Spirit work with us? Because you said earlier that, you know, Jesus says, my father and I will come with you and we'll make our home in you. And Jesus said, the counselor, he'll tell you what to say. He'll help you out. So, we talk about that as the Holy Spirit. So maybe talk a little bit more, the two of you. How does the Holy Spirit then help in mm -hmm. prayer? Well, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Stripling, do you <laughs> think that implication um, on that side of the cross, we're talking about ancient Near Eastern Israel, before the Holy Spirit was indwelling in the people of God, was that a mechanism as to why there was no silent prayer, maybe? Because who are you talking to? There's nobody. It's just me in here. Mm. Well, yeah, I I don't think so. I think that it's just um, culturally how they how they were responding. They just it had never crossed their mind to be self conscious. Gotcha. And, yeah. and, you know, there's sort of the the sense of timidity we have post fall as opposed to pre fall. Um, self conscious about ourselves. Some some of that stuff we're still trying to get off of us, you know. I, I am now in the the new covenant. I am back with the Edenic covenant. I have direct access to God. I'm able to talk directly with Him, and um, I'm not saying that you know I, that I'm comfortable tomorrow going out in the middle of whatever town center in, in Katy and just you know having these loud outward prayers or something like that because that could. Well, speaking of that. Um, we're going to start winding down shortly, but that's a great point. Does God ever change his mind about prayer? Because God told Jonah to go do something. Jonah doesn't want to go. He runs away. God makes sure he gets back. He says, okay, I think I get the point. I'll go preach to Nineveh. And then when he preaches in the square, like you're saying, you don't necessarily want, don't want to be crazy. But then they actually repent. And God's like, wow, look at them. Not only the people, but the animals are in sackcloth and ashes. and I'm going to delay the punishment. And then Jonah's like, man, I'm super ticked. I just prayed for them and preached to them. And I knew you wouldn't, you know, destroy them. And they end up getting destroyed later because they fall back into sin. But that's a great 
question and maybe a point, do we pray about stuff maybe in one direction and then God, for whatever reason, does, does he change his mind? I mean, how does, how does that work? Yeah. Well, I guess that gets back to what I was saying earlier about Romans 8, 14 says, those who are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons and daughters of God. It's knowing what he's saying and coming into agreement and alignment. I change my mind, you change your mind. And I think God changes his mind about some things too. Um, you mentioned that we're sort of landing the ship here. I was thinking about if each one of us had like a, a hint for lack of a better word, but one sort of practice that people might take away from this. And mine would be, um, like pray on the spot. Don't just, when possible, don't just say, well, I'll be praying for you, but but pray for them. Just take them by the hand or whatever and just pray right then and come into agreement. And I don't know if you remember this, Dr. Lewis, but the first time I ever came to your, your office, like in 2011 or 2012 or something like this, and um, I remember a couple of times during our conversation, you just said, well, let's just pray about that right now. And let's let's pray right now. And what what a great way to engage. So that would be my suggestion to people if they're wanting to add a little spice to their prayer life is don't procrastinate in prayer, but pray now. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. Normalize prayer. Yeah. Ask. Like we're, we're advocates of consent. Like, is it okay if I pray with you right now? Um, and then go for it. Something yeah. I love, um, we learn to pray by praying. Mm. And the gap I've seen like post liturgy, you know, we're in this age of the church where not all of us are using liturgy. Not all of us are using ancient prayers. Um, but there's a reason why those things exist. And there's a reason why they last so long, right? Um, you learn to pray by praying and just start get present with the Holy Spirit and say, teach me to pray. That's exactly what the disciples did with the Lord. And he showed them how to pray. And, and I think um, we, we miss that sometimes, whether it's Western church or long-term followers of Jesus, um, we don't really know how to pray. And then it becomes, I'm, I don't know how to do this personally. So why would I ever be confident to do this publicly? Oh my gosh. Um, so really back to that Matthew 6, 6, get to know the Lord, listen, be with him so that when those opportunities arise, you're not talking about a stranger. You're not wondering. You are confident. Most of the time, I feel compelled. Like there are times when the Lord has said, pray for that person on the spot. And I've been timid and have to get in my car and turn around and come back because the Lord has compelled and convicted me because I know him. And I know that I have an answer because the answer is Jesus. So I agree. Yeah. Pray on the spot and get to know the Lord. Ask the Lord to teach you how to pray by praying. Good. I think too, probably as we wrap up, probably a great image for all of us is that if you've got kids or even parents or whatever, um, we've got three kids and I communicate with all three kids differently. Um, right. I don't do the exact same thing with each of them. And I think God can reach and talk to us. We can talk to God and have those communications. There's not necessarily a singular, only one way. God shows a very many examples in scripture of private and public prayer and group prayer and speaking in tongues and speaking in the language there. And there's all kinds of different ways that God prays. So it may be, maybe we get caught up sometimes in trying to find the right little way mm -hmm. to pray when really God is just waiting for us to have a conversation, um, <laughs> just like we would with our kids. And it's just spending that time together. And um, it, it, for me, really having kids has probably helped me understand the perspective of God as a father. And as a parent than anything else, they're all different. We all communicate differently, but we, we learn to communicate. We work on it. You know, it's a process and sometimes we all get what we want. And sometimes there's delays and sometimes we change it up, but it is a living relationship and we're having a conversation that's ongoing. So we uh, thank our audience for joining us today. We, uh, Dr. Stripling, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Um, Samantha, thank you for joining us. And, uh, if anybody wants to know more about the Great Southwest Prayer Center, um, you can go to their website. I think it's the Great Southwest Prayer Center dot org. Um, it's also linked through Grace Fellowship, which is what is Grace dot org. And of course, the Bible Seminary, you can visit the Bible Seminary at the Bible Seminary dot edu. Um, we do practice prayer. We do teach prayer as part of what we're doing. And um, we engage in the conversation with the Lord. Uh, we thank you for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time on the TBS podcast. Thanks for joining us on the TBS podcast. To keep up with our latest insights and episodes, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform.
Your support helps us bring you more engaging content. See you next time for more exciting discussions.